This afternoon, we are going to be talking about conference presentations. Very important part of our publication supply chain that we introduced this morning. We are going to particularly be talking about how to present our paper, but also meeting our editor and reviewer. We are going to introduce to you the idea that publication is a little bit political and that it is important to write well. Yes, it's important to have good research, certainly. But also, another factor is who influences our paper, who reviews our paper. Two humans decide if we live or die, and we care about their opinion. So we're going to talk a little bit about the reviewer relationship and how we can meet our reviewers when we are at the conference, which is probably the only place where we really have the chance to meet them. Let me begin with this idea that in writing and in, in science, whoever presents the data gets the credit. This is true for writing too. Nobody cares what you've done until you write a paper about it. Until you write a paper about it, it's like it never happened. You're not appreciated for it. You're not acknowledged for it. And the same is true with presentations. No one knows what you've done until you have presented it at a conference. An example of this is uh, Paul Chu. Paul Chu is credited with being the first person to discover the semiconductor with a boiling point above liquid nitrogen. Actually, Paul Chu was chosen from three authors. We never hear about Ma Quan Wu or Jim Ashburn, the co-authors, because they were shy of speaking in public. So Paul Chu presented, even though Paul Chu gave credit in his speech to his co-authors, no one remembers them. Gone, finished. Paul Chu still recognized and awarded for that. Why? Because he presented about it. Uh, Zhiji Sheng, postdoctoral researcher, University of uh, uh, Arkansas, discovered another superconductor with an even higher temperature. But because his English wasn't good, he asked Alan Herman, the department chair, to speak at the press conference. Alan Herman now gets the credit for that contribution, even though many times he credited this author. People give credit to the one who can talk and write which is why these skills are so fundamental to scientific writing, to science. Students tell me, teacher, it doesn't matter about writing and uh, talking. What's important is the lab. But we can't separate what happens in the lab from how we present what happens in the lab. They go together. We can often destroy our contribution by not presenting or presenting poorly which is why this is such a fundamental skill to every domain, we've got to be able to talk about our results. You've all seen bad conference presentations. I just saw one recently. I was at a conference and uh, the speaker stood up, walked to the front, sat down behind a table opened his paper and started to read in a low, dead voice. After about two minutes, 20 people stood up, walked out. He looked up, just me and one other guy sitting there. People don't have patience for bad presentations. People give up quickly. And I want to introduce to you the idea that your number one goal as a presenter is don't let people go to sleep. That's number one. Don't let people run away. If they go to sleep, if they run away, doesn't matter if you're a genius. They're sleeping. They're gone. You failed. Goal number one, keep them there. Don't let them sleep. This is why, as scientific presenters, we've got to take our presentations seriously, too. And this is exactly what I do in my Jiao Da class. I have, and also in Zhongyang this semester. I have my technical writing class, but I also have conference presentation class, 18 weeks. 
We take students through step by step. I wrote a book about this too. Going to the conference, preparing the PowerPoint, meeting the reviewers, meeting the editor, because they're so critical. And we go to the conference to meet our reviewers. We're going to get to that in a moment. So an effective talk must do two things. Number one, persuade your audience with evidence. And two, be interesting and entertaining. Now, we emphasize the first one a lot. But great evidence with no interest is still a failure. It doesn't matter, again, how good you are, how good your research is, if people aren't really paying attention if you're losing them because of your delivery, because of your presentation, you're still failing. So we talk instead of reading. We stand up. We move around. We make eye contact with our audience. We don't look at only one side of the room. We look at both sides. And we imitate good speakers we see in our own domain. I think this is important because when we are looking for a model to use when we're practicing our speech, we don't want to watch politicians on television. That's just a wrong model. It doesn't work for us. We need to find those scientists in our research area who are interesting. When we go to the conference, we can be learning not only about their research, but about their presentation style. And I'm going to do this today. I want to talk about this today. Nobel Prize winners have paid special attention to this. I'm going to give you examples of several Nobel Prize winners today, their speeches, and comments from their students on their speeches to show you how much great scientists care about their presentation ability, how much they practice, even though many of them did not speak English as their first language. They made their speaking ability a priority because they knew they would not get respect for their contribution until they could interest their audience. I'm going to give you a number of cases today. And I want you next time you're at a conference and you see a speaker in your domain who is interesting, how do you know he's interested? Look around. Are people sleeping? If they're not, if they're looking at the speaker, and if they're interested, then start turning on your mental recorder. <laughs> Think, what is he doing that you can copy and steal and use yourself? Integrate it. Imitate it. The best way that you can learn from someone else similar, like you, present it. Of course, we need to ask the question, why do smart people give such bad talks? Why do we often see, you know, great researchers fail when they present? Of course, the really great ones don't fail. That's why they're great, because they're able to overcome that, and they're over able to get attention anyway. But I think it's important to understand that writing a paper and presenting that paper are very different skills. When we write, we write differently than when we speak. And this is for a lot of different reasons. First, when I write, I can use complicated vocabulary, difficult words. Because if my reader doesn't understand me, he can open his dictionary and he can look. But when I'm speaking, can my reader open his dictionary? No time. It's already gone. It's past. And if I lose him, he'll be spending time thinking about the meaning of my sentence and my English instead of the meaning of my content. I cannot allow complicated, difficult words to distract and lose my listener. So when we speak, we must be simple. We must be short. Now that's a bit different from writing. In writing, we also want to be short. But we are, more able, we are able to use uh, more complicated words than in speaking. Also, the organization of a paper is different from the organization of a speech. Someone could be tired of reading my paper, close the paper, go get a drink of water, come back. That's not true in my speech. I need to keep people with me all the time. In my paper, if people are distracted, they can quit. They can take a break. In my speech, if they take a break, I lose them. They're gone. They may never come back. So it's much more difficult, in a way, 